Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and in the epic Game of Thrones staring contest between the Night King and a tree, if you smile, you lose. While the Night King was grinning like it's picture day, Branch Stark and his tree face won the night. Well, with a little help from Arya. The Battle of Winterfell was such an insanely crafted 80 minutes of television, so I'm going to do another in-depth scene-by-scene analysis with all the interesting details and connections that you might have overlooked, some of which you can catch by just brightening the picture quality, others by just drinking and knowing things. Let's start by checking in with the opening credits, which include two new subtle changes. First, the flipping blue tiles representing the progress of the Army of the Dead have now arrived all the way to the Winterfell defenses. But even more interestingly, down in the Winterfell crypts, the flickering torchlights now snuff out, row by row, until the darkness hits us like a wave. This visual foreshadows the way the Dothraki's flaming rocks get snuffed out later, the way the darkness hit the Unsullied like a wave, and of course, the corpse is buried here, resurrecting, to literally no one's surprise. The opening image of the episode is a close-up of the trembling hands of Samwell Tarly as he's being armed with dragonglass daggers. This episode keeps coming back to the close-ups of characters' hands. Archer's hands, Arya's hand, the Night King's hand. Considering Arya later kills the Night King with a literal sleight of hand, this opening image functions as a setup of a magic trick, telling us where to keep our eye. Similarly, the opening spoken word of this episode is worth noting. Move. Yeah, move your ass, Sam. Tormund Giant's face reminded us last season that in the cold, to move is to survive. You got to keep moving, and that's the secret. Walking's good, fighting's better, f***ing's best. This directive to move becomes kind of the game of this episode. Moving keeps you safe and warm, whereas paralysis allows the cold to take you. Later this episode, when Jon chases the Night King outside the castle, he knows he must keep moving or the dead will catch him, until he has stopped moving and faced the dead head on. Meanwhile, the primary mover of this episode is Arya, pedometer off the charts, and her ability to stay in motion led her to score the ultimate victory. Also worth noting that Arya has been on top of her class by Tormund standards, as the one character to, in the past 24 hours, walk, fight, and Back here with Sam, the camera follows his movement in an unbroken tracking shot through the Winterfell courtyard. If you listen closely here, the sound mixer amplified Sam's nervous breathing. And when Lyanna Mormont shouts behind him, Sam jumps! So worked up that every sudden noise triggers him. This refusal to cut away from Sam, the lack of dialogue here, and the focus on Sam's inner anxiety makes the viewers feel like we're trudging around in the snowy mud with this nervous wreck. We are feeling this tension. This episode was directed by the great Miguel Sapochnik, known for directing battle sequences like the Battle of the Bastards and Hard Home. But I actually think his finer work was in the season six finale, The Winds of Winter, which opened with a similar visually driven point of view heavy sequence. Both in that episode and in here, Sapochnik uses close-ups of the last-minute minutia to show how these characters are actually preparing for their own funerals. The tracking shot hands off to Tyrion Lannister, who, unlike Sam, wants to join the others on the front line. He feels useless down in the crypts. So, like his sister does while waiting out a siege down below, Tyrion goes for the wine. More wine. Each new point of view during this sequence is introduced by a thunderous drum sound effect. The composer is Ramin Jawadi, a genius. He does a lot of cool stuff this episode. And here he's using these drums to evoke an echoing thunderclap, a storm on the horizon, to hint at the blizzard that these soldiers are about to find themselves in. You might also recognize a bit of a similarity between this pre-battle score and Hans Zimmer's score in The Dark Knight. Jawadi later actually uses strings that bend up the scale to create this uncomfortable distortion. Kind of like a plain nose dive makes her flesh crawl. This also evokes Zimmer's Dark Knight score. It's the Joker theme used for the same effect. He turns to me and he says, why so serious? Sir Brienne of Tarth commands the left flank, and one of her knights of the Vale behind her anxiously stirs. Later, when the whites storm in, a number of these knights break rank and flee. As Sir Jorah faces a wall of darkness, a night that is dark and full of terrors. From that night comes a flicker of hope, Lady Melisandre. As a red priestess of the Lord of Light, Melisandre resurrected Jon Snow at Castle Black in season six, and she plays a similar game-changing role this episode. Jon 
Jon and Davos banished her from Winterfell after the Battle of the Bastards in her role for burning Shireen Baratheon. And we last saw her in Dragonstone, telling Varys that they would both die in Westeros and saying that she would go to Volantis in the meantime. Remember, in Volantis in Season 5, Tyrion saw another priestess from that religion preaching, suggesting that it may be kind of a spiritual hub for Melisandre to recharge her magic for one last miracle. Sapochnik's biggest influence in staging this battle was the nighttime siege of Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings and Two Towers. Melisandre's last second arrival is the first of many parallels. The elf Haldir provided similar last second backup at Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep was fought in heavy rain, Winterfell was fought in heavy snow. Both featured desperate torch runs, women and children hiding in the caverns, the terror of the enemy as it climbs over the battlements, and a heartbreaking breach of the fortress walls spilling the fight into the inner layer as the fight goes closer and closer to the heart of this fortress. But despite these aesthetic parallels, Sapochnik actually made the Battle of Winterfell play out a bit differently from Helm's Deep in a few key ways. I'll get to those later. Melisandre greets Grey Worm with a common exchange. Valar Morgulis. Valar du Hyris. Meaning all men must die, all men must serve. A greeting we first heard in context with Arya and Jacques and Hagar. Inside, Melisandre gives a long, meaningful look at Arya. And all of this links Melisandre and Hlor's role in this battle with Arya Stark. She, turns out, is the Lord of Light's champion here. This episode is called The Long Night, a literal description of this extended nighttime battle, a battle to prevent permanent darkness, but also The Long Night is the name of the legendary winter 8,000 years prior that lasted a generation when the White Walkers last descended upon Westeros and were driven back in a war for the dawn. Worshippers of the Lord of Light, like Melisandre, preach that a hero named Azor Ahai, bearing a flaming sword called Lightbringer, vanquished the White Walkers, and that Azor Ahai would be reborn in another to repeat history. We have speculated that this prince or princess that was promised would be Jon or Daenerys, based on several clues that one of them, or maybe both, would fulfill this prophecy. But this episode, Arya plays the most decisive Azor Ahaian role. Despite not really meeting all the cryptic requirements from the books, like being born beneath the bleeding star, and awakening dragons from stone, and being from the Targaryen bloodline. But Arya's heroism doesn't mean Jon and Danny won't have a role to play in the endgame of this series. This episode marks the end of the conflict with the natural threat, the Night King, the White Walkers, so that the final episodes of Game of Thrones can redirect on the real conflict of the series, the war for the throne, the existential struggle between light and dark, and these characters' reactions to the external enemy have been the source of their conflicts between them. Now Melisandre is opening the door for them to refocus on the Iron Throne. This episode actually literalizes this thematic transition with an overhead shot of Melisandre's entrance to Winterfell. The light streaks across the muddy snow to create the shape of the Iron Throne. Melisandre ignites the Dothraki Arax, thankfully giving us some light in the sequence, and inspiring their cavalry charge, which ends in complete doom for the Dothraki. As the tip of the spear plunges into the darkness, the undead front line suddenly emerges from the dark, with the Dothraki eyes redirecting upward to face a giant white. Sapochnik depicts their decimation from a distance, with their flaming weapons snuffing out one by one. This image evokes ships on a horizon, with each light extinguishing reflecting a ship sinking, the fading of all hope. So why did Melisandre ignite their weapons just to send these Dothraki to their deaths? Why did the Dothraki Leroy Jenkins with a blind cavalry charge? Who thought this would be a good battle strategy? Well, yes, in real world history, medieval cavalry charges were used to shock and destabilize the enemy's infantry lines. And I suppose these flaming weapons inspired the Dothraki to think they'd be able to see their enemy clearly enough. Perhaps this this was a deliberate move by Melisandre, a way to spur Danny to freak out over losing her beloved Dothraki, abandon their battle plans, and actually bring Drogon into the battle early, which would lead to a sloppier dragon fight outside the castle walls that left Bran less defended, necessitating a different champion to deliver the death blow. I know it's a bit convoluted, but according to Bran, every past mistake is actually a crucial step toward destiny. The army of the dead crashes into the unsullied and northerners like a tsunami, but Danny and Drogon light up the whites with dragon fire. Jawadi scores her rescue with the House Targaryen theme, the show's way of signaling dragon power. But when it's revealed that Jon and Rhaegal have joined them, Jawadi mixes the music with the love theme of the dragon and the wolf, the show's way of signaling aunt nephew incest.
John and Danny target the White Walker generals along the tree line, but the White Walker generals summon this massive blizzard. This blizzard plunges them all back in darkness, creating a literal and metaphorical fog of war that sends these soldiers into a panic. Many TV viewers complain that this darkness made the action a bit too hard to follow, but I think this was mostly an aesthetic choice, a way to disorient the viewer the way these soldiers feel disoriented. Within this fog, Rhaegal and Drogon collide, another example of this external, natural conflict causing a drama between the human characters. And on the ground, the fog leads to true chaos. In one of the brief moments of light, the dragon torches a row of whites, incinerating the giant white with a sizzle. The defenses crumble. Dolorous Ed is the first named character to die this season, and Grey Worm trips a bridge to trap his fellow unsullied troops on the outside of the trench. We saw Grey Worm testing this last episode. Arya sends Sansa into the crypts with a dragon glass dagger, advising, Sticking with the pointy end. Of course, a callback to Jon's advice to Arya back in season one when he gave her needle. Sticking with the pointy end. In the God's Wood, Bran thanks Theon for defending him and then says, I'm going to go now. Go where? Oh, sorry, I can't answer my lips are tree bark. Bran wargs into some nearby birds to fly up to the Night King on Viserion, who's hovering over the blizzard above Winterfell. The Night King reaches his hand out, reminding us of the moment he marked Bran with his hand, suggesting that he now might be activating that homing beacon that the mark represents. And with his hand, the Night King forms a path to Bran by summoning the whites to lay their bodies on the fire to form a bridge for the others to cross over. But Bran spends the rest of this episode doing nothing besides remaining in his warg state and I guess using his roots to absorb water from the ground soil. But where does Bran go? Is it really that much fun to live in those stupid birds? I have a few theories. Bran seems to know pieces of how this destiny needs to play out. For example, he was the one who gave Arya that Valyrian steel dagger last season, in the exact spot that Arya would later use it to kill the Night King, saying, It's wasted on a cripple. Bran knew that Arya needed to wield this Valyrian steel, so maybe he warged through time into the past to make certain this dagger got where it needed to go. Remember, this priceless Valyrian blade was always an odd placement in these events. It was strange that a low-rent assassin was carrying such a relic. Peter Baelish actually used that clue to try to frame Tyrion Lannister for Bran's murder attempt, but ended up backfiring as evidence in his own murder trial. But it's worth noting that Baelish never fully confessed to introducing the dagger into the equation. I guess Arya didn't exactly give him a chance. So what if Bran was actually the one to introduce this crucial weapon into the first part of this whole historical timeline? Like ward back in time and make sure Littlefinger gets his hands on that dagger, all to guarantee it eventually gets to the Starks and in the hands of Arya Stark and into the belly of the Night King. I have another theory for where Bran could have gone. Before I get to that, thank you to Experian for sponsoring this episode. Experian lets you boost your credit scores instantly for free by doing what you're already doing, paying your utilities and your cell phone bill. So if you're like me and you bought a bunch of unnecessary medieval weaponry with a credit card and forgot to pay it off, now there's an easy way to get back up to a credit score that makes you feel like a grown-up. A higher credit score can help you establish credit or get access to preferred credit options. It used to take months to improve your credit scores, but with Experian Boost, you can improve your scores instantly. Most people who use Boost see an increase greater than 10 points. Up until now, you pay your utility bill and your cell phone bills and you don't really get any additional credit for it. Now you can Boost is safe, secure, and 100% free. No credit card required. Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash New Rockstars. Jump on this. Okay, back to Bran. Another theory is that Bran could be attempting to warg into the Night King himself, like a psychic battle of the minds. Note that Bran waited to peace out until after Theon told him that the trench was ignited. Maybe Bran breathed briefly tried to tap into the Night King's mind to form this white bridge, which would lure the Night King into the Winterfell Godswood, exactly where Bran knew Arya would be poised to strike. Wherever you think Bran rolled his eyes to, Arya is definitely the focal character of this episode. Each of her scenes here remind us specifically of different stages of her character's growth. Sticking with the pointy end reflects her acquisition of Needle in season one, and her badassery with her staff on the battlement echoes her combat training in Braavos. She and the Hound both save each other in the battle in different times, just as they looked after each other during their partnership in season four. She creeps alone in the dark, terrified, just as she was as a girl escaping King's Landing in season one. And of course, Melisandre repeats the famous words of Arya's first teacher, Cyril Pharrell. What do we say to the god of death? 
Not today. And there is only one thing we say to death. Not today. All of these callbacks with Arya are meant to establish her as a fierce warrior, a worthy champion, and the one person in this battle with the skills to take down the Night King. Sapochnik shifts aesthetically from the Helm's deep nighttime siege imagery to a more survival horror genre. He said that the less actual fighting you have in a sequence, the better, because killing upon killing desensitizes the audience and not really feeling anything. So now the episode takes on more horror influences. The whites swarm over the walls, similar to the zombies of World War Z, and Arya sneaks around her old home, avoiding the undead, like the characters in the house in George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. One of the whites slowly scrapes a sword creepily along the floor, another common horror trope. The contrast of this interior setting to the outdoor battle brings a whole different kind of fear. The vast open darkness and swarms of undead triggered agoraphobia. This enclosed space triggers claustrophobia, with the walls Arya once saw as her home now transformed into a death maze similar to the maze of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. When Arya hides beneath the table, the blood from her forehead wound makes the loudest drips ever. Kerplunk! Kerplunk! Shush that blood! These amplified blood drops actually reveal Arya's otherwise quietness. Her footsteps and movements are quieter than a soft drip. This is another reminder of her training from Cyril Pharrell, who taught Arya to be swift as a deer and quiet as a shadow, or as he said on the show, quick as a snake or as quiet as a shadow. Arya joins with the Hound and Beric Dondarrion, who saves Arya, barricading the passageway as the Whites stab him, similar to the way Hodor hoded the door to let Bran escape. During this sacrifice, Beric holds his arms out, forming a Christ pose, which is appropriate considering his Lord of Light religion is very much the Westerosi equivalent of monotheistic religions like Christianity. Melisandre tells Arya that Beric's death was destined to bring Arya to this moment. And Arya recalls the last time these two women met. You said I'd shut many eyes forever. You were right about that too. Brown eyes, green eyes, and blue eyes. This is a callback to Melisandre's season three promise. I see a darkness in you, and in that darkness, eyes staring back at me. Brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes. Eyes, you'll shut forever. We will meet again. Melisandre was right! Arya has killed people with brown eyes like Marin Trant and green eyes like Walder Frey. It's also worth noting Cersei Lannister has green eyes, suggesting Arya might kill her as well, but you know, we'll see. Arya's experiences watching Lady Crane perform as Cersei in Bravo suggested that Arya might have some sympathy for Cersei's losses as a mother. But the blue eyes of Melisandre's prediction have yet to be fulfilled, which Arya now interprets to mean the blue eyes of the Night King. Melisandre and Arya echo Sirio, not today, Satan, and Jorati sends Arya off with intensifying battle drums. Outside, an undead white bursts through the gate of Winterfell, attacking young Lyanna Mormont. Sapochnik is calling back his visual from the Battle of the Bastards. When the giant 1-1 broke through these gates, Lyanna bravely stabs his giant in the eye, bringing him down. The visual of this lone blue eye of a giant calls back the giant from the March of the Army of the Dead that opened season seven, with the shot focusing on his blue eye. Lyanna's badass move should make her Lyanna Giant's Bane, like Tor Tormund. There's actually a fan theory that Tormund could actually be Lyanna Mormont's father, given his favorite story that he once betted a bear. That bear could have been Mage Mormont. The Mormont sigil is the bear, and Mage was known as the she-bear. An aerial dragon battle wages above, and Rhaegal bites a chunk out of Viserion's cheek, causing blue flame to bleed out every time he snaps or bites. Drogon knocks the Night King off Viserion, attempts Dracarys on him, but it doesn't work. Another hint that Arya was onto something last week, and that skepticism, meaning she might be the one to take him down. Dragonfire will stop him. I don't know. John chases down the Night King, but the Night King resurrects the dead, unsullied northerners, Dothraki wildlings, everybody who just died out there. Their eyes flip open blue, just like the ones on the dead of Hardhome. Newly resurrected includes Dolores Ed, aw, and Lyanna Mormont, aw. From this point forward, every time we see one of the more recent whites get slashed, the effects team included a detail of them bleeding a lot more, since their corpses are fresher. This latest resurrection also apparently affects the dead of the Winterfell crypts. Soldiers outside pound on the walls begging to be let in, but then their voices go silent, much like the poor souls trapped outside the gates at Hardhome. But you know what? They wouldn't be any safer inside. 
because we see the shocking resurrection of the corpses. Seeing these crypts burst open is a terror foreshadowed back in the first book when John experienced a nightmare showing this. There are some famous Starks buried down here. Lyanna Stark, Rickon Stark, at least the bones of Ned Stark. But none of these rising corpses look too familiar. Aside from this guy, who looks a lot like Maester Lewin. That said, Lewin probably wouldn't be buried here. The crypts are for Stark family members only, and when Lewin died, Winterfell was controlled by the Greyjoys. After that, the Boltons. I doubt either group would give the old family's maester an honorable burial. Speaking of Lewin, as Theon battles in the Godswood, defending Bran, it pays off a throwaway line from Lewin back in season one, when Rob wanted to avenge Bran, and Theon backed him up. Once it comes to that, you know I'll stand behind what? you. Is there going to be a battle in the Godswood? Now, Theon is fulfilling that promise to defend Bran. And Lewin's an old, goofy-looking corpse. Maybe. I don't know if that's him. As Sansa and Bran face the darkness, Jawadi scores this final march with a simple piano melody. <laughs> These hopeless chords take half steps down, giving this feeling of one step forward, two steps back, reflecting how these warriors are sinking deeper and deeper in despair. Piano is hardly ever used on Game of Thrones since it's a more modern instrument and Jawadi only really wanted to use older strings, percussion, and choral chants for his music on the show. The only exception before this episode was the Winds of Winter with the Light of the Seven. That use of piano signaled the changing of seasons, Cersei's ascendancy to the throne, Daenerys' return to Westeros. Jawadi chose to use the piano one more time here for the Night King score. And like Light of the Seven, the piano notes lead a wordless march to death, ending in an epic explosive twist. The structure and composition even mirror the Light of the Seven. Both songs heighten from the bass piano melody to a more layered theme with strings. And in both songs, the flurry of layers cuts out suddenly to a coda, returning back to the simple piano melody once more before the final charge. Until eventually, the finale cuts to silence as we hold our breaths before the death blow comes. If you listen closely to the moment Arya drops the dagger from one hand to the other, Jawadi mixed in this eerie chime. This is actually the first note of the recurring White Walker theme music. Arya is returning the Night King and all the White Walkers back to ice. But how was Arya able to pull this off? Again, this whole episode has recalled Arya's years of training to get to this moment. Her steps being quieter than the drops of blood reminded us of her agility, swift as a deer, quiet as a shadow. And even recently, she snuck up on Jon in the same spot. He used to be taller. How did you sneak up on me? So it makes sense that she would be able to slip past these White Walker generals just fast enough, breezing past their perfectly conditioned hair, proving them to be the worst Secret Service security ever. And this move that Arya uses on the Night King, dropping the dagger from one hand to the other, is the exact same move she pulled on Brienne during their sparring session last season. If that cool move surprised the best warrior in Westeros, it makes sense it would work on the Night King. So this means the dagger has been the most important weapon on this series. It appeared in the second episode episode of the series, Bran armed Arya with it last season, perhaps knowing its future significance in her hands. Also last season, an image of this same dagger showed up in a book that Samuel Tarly read. In addition to it being made of a rare priceless metal, it's actually a famous relic. Its dragonbone hilt has led some to believe that it once belonged to House Targaryen, perhaps even Aegon the Conqueror himself, whom George R. R. Martin hinted might have launched his whole conquest of Westeros purely to stop the Night King. In some sense, he saw what was coming. 300 years later and wanted to unify the Seven Kingdoms to be better prepared for the threat that he eventually saw coming 
from the north. So the destruction of the Night King and the White Walkers redefines the central conflict of Game of Thrones as less of a man versus nature existential drama than a man versus man political drama. Some are speculating the Night King could return, like through the magic of the original Weirwood tree in the far north. I could see that, could be fun, but really it looks as though the HBO series is leaving all that mythology theory prophecy for the books, maybe for the new spin-off prequel series in development, and restoring Game of Thrones to the battle among political factions for the Iron Throne. The episode ends with another death, Sir Jorah Mormont. Aww. As Daenerys hugs his body, Drogon wraps both of them in a group hug. Aww. The closing image shows Melisandre completing her promise to Sir Davos that she would die before the sun rises. She disrobes, takes off her necklace, and collapses in the snow, recalling the moment after she's resurrected Jon in season 6. Perhaps she dies because performing these kind of Lord of Light miracles takes all the energy out of her, a sacrifice so that others may succeed. This shot of her death march alone in the snow is a cinematic image that we've seen before in all kinds of westerns. You may know it from Mad Max Fury Road, the shot of Furiosa at the end of her rope and collapsing in the sand. It's the kind of hero walks into the sunset shot. Except here, it's a march into sunrise. The long night is over, the war for the dawn is won, and the war for the throne wages on. Do you think Melisandre's death, along with the deaths of other proponents of this faith, like Beric Dondarrion and Thoros of Mir last season, mean the magic and mythology of the Lord of Light is dead in Westeros? Or do miracles like Melisandre's role in the Battle of Winterfell, Arya's victory, and Jon's resurrection mean the Lord of Light is stronger than ever? And were the clues on the show that Jon Snow or Daenerys Targaryen would be revealed as Azor Ahai Reborn, the prince slash princess that was promised, all manipulations by the Red God to position these two characters in place to open a path for Arya to be the princess that was promised. Comment down below with your thoughts and theories. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. And subscribe to us on YouTube at New Rockstars or to our podcast feeds, Westeros Weekly and Inside Marvel, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for joining me. And seriously, if you're looking for a vigilant security guard or a bouncer, do not hire the White Walkers.